Decarbonizing electricity is one of the biggest challenges and opportunities of our time, yet the pace of renewable deployment remains too slow to meet ambitious climate goals. This is Powering the Future, a podcast series brought to you by Smart Grid Forums, One Planet, One Power Grid. Joining us today is John Riley, Head of Renewable Energy at BNM. He's here to explore the global context, Ireland's unique challenges, and the crucial role of the grid in driving the energy transition. Okay, thank you, John, for joining us on this podcast today. Yeah, I'm absolutely delighted to be here, and thank you very much for the invitation. So, John, before we dive into some of the questions that I have for you, it would be great to understand a bit more about um, your organization's profile in the energy sector and also your own role and responsibilities and your priorities right now. Yeah, so um, B&M is a, a state-owned u- utility company that operates in the wholesale electricity market on the island of Ireland. We, we don't have a footprint or an operation footprint outside of the Irish market. Um, we are, I suppose, our history as, an, as a company traces back almost 100 years. The, 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 the company was founded back in the 1930s to help the then fledgling Irish state meet its energy needs using an indigenous fuel called peat. Um, and I suppose our our former name as a former peat company was Borden Mona, and Mona is the Irish or the Gaelic word for peat. Um, but in recent years, we have turned away from that fossil fuel business to effectively focus 100% our attention, of our attention on growing our renewable energy business as a utility company in the Irish market. Right. Okay. That's fantastic. And in terms of renewable energy, well, it's, you know, it's the trend in the sector now. It's quite an urgent matter as well. Everybody's working hard to make it a reality. Um, what's your assessment in terms of how fast the renewable uh, energy sector is growing and dominating. Yeah, I think if you, I, I think, and obviously what we're talking about here is is renewable electricity uh, as opposed to renewable heat or or renewable transport. But from a renewable electricity perspective, I think if you look at things globally, um, the last twenty years, I think the world has made and the world's power systems have made great strides forward in terms of displacing fossil fuels with with, with renewables in the main let's say, the growth of, of onshore and offshore wind and ever increasingly solar. And that has been mirrored here in the Irish market. If you went back 25 years ago, a basket of coal, oil and peat, which was our core business at the time, met 70% of demand annually for Irish electricity customers. Today, that basket of fossil fuels only meets 2 to 3%. Peat is completely gone. Coal has ceased this year and oil is effectively gone out of the mix. And that has been replaced in the main by renewables and, of course, flexible gas-fired capacity. So I suppose the the transition, the energy transition of the Irish electric power system is mir- mirrors what is happening globally. The the concerning thing for, for us in B&M is that I suppose the pace of elect- electricity system decarbonisation which had moved forward very significantly, in my view, in the period from 2000 to 2020. So let's say the first part of this century. There is real signs of that slowing. There there is no question or doubt about that. Um, We've seen the challenges and the difficulties there is in terms of moving the global offshore sector forward. I think it's hit a bit of a a, a roadblock um, in terms of momentum. Um, And that is concerning because offshore wind will obviously be a significant powerhouse in a decarbonized electric power a power system. Um, so I think we need to look at why uh, the pace of decarbonization is slowing and, and, and what are the things that we can do about it. Because I think as an energy professional of 25 years whose career has spanned that energy transition, for the first time in that 25 years, I'm concerned that we are losing momentum. And if you start to lose momentum, things can shift and change very quickly. And what do you think are some of the reasons that we're losing momentum? I think there are probably two big issues from our perspective. First and foremost is cost. Um, in, in, in many ways, we have sold the story here that if we move from fossil fuels, which are expensive, to cost-effective renewables, um, energy prices will fall and everything will be great. Um, and that, of course... I think is correct. I think energy prices in the future on systems dominated by intermittent renewables such as wind and solar will be cheaper than they would otherwise be. The problem is that consumers 
were expecting and, and continue to expect that energy prices should be falling. That is not happening in the main because of the level of investment that's required here, and particularly the investment in the networks. Um, the old power networks that we had, if you take the island of Ireland and you went back 25 years ago, we had somewhere in the region of 25 point locations on the power system where we had thermal power stations that generated power to meet the economy's electricity needs. Today, that system has changed completely in that now we have a much more dispersed, geographical dispersion. And if you looked at the generation map of Ireland today, it, looked like, it would look like the country had got a dose of the measles. So we have generation assets everywhere because onshore wind and increasingly solar um, assets at scale are being deployed right across the island of Ireland. And, and that is putting significant pressure on the network. The old topography of networks simply will not accommodate this new world. It won't. And I think in telling that story about the energy transition, I think we got the story around the cost element and the level of investment that might be required wrong. And therefore, cost efficiency and cost is becoming a, an increasing focus right now globally and here in Ireland, cost competitiveness. And, and it's unfortunate that, I suppose, in, particularly here in Europe, where we've had the terrible conflict in, 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 in Ukraine and all that has gone with that, and the impact that that has had on energy prices in Europe um, because of the gas story in the main, that has caused a lot of consumers to question the energy transition, which, of course, is wrong. I, I mean, the way we get away from our reliance on high-priced fossil fuels is to, is to look more at renewables, but that requires investment. So that pricing piece, I think, is, is the first story. The second story is it relates really in relation to the expansion of power networks. Um, if you take our own situation here in Ireland, um, government energy policy would see us having somewhere in the region of 22 gigawatts of intermittent renewables, mainly wind and solar, installed on our electric power system by 2030. Um, today, we're less than halfway to that target. We have somewhere in the region of seven gigawatts, give or take, and the power system is struggling to manage that. Um, from an, op from an efficiency, efficient operation perspective, we have very, very high levels of constraints when the wind is blowing, and even now when the sun is shining. So just moving that power around the system and operating the system efficiently, going back to what I said earlier on, the requirement to invest in networks and grid. So those bottlenecks, that bottleneck around the grid is the single biggest technical bar barrier, in my view, to moving to the next level. Right, okay. In terms of costs, are we ever likely to see reduced cost of uh, renewable energy, or should we not be looking at cost at all? Um, I think, first and foremost, we absolutely should be looking at costs. I mean, energy and energy provision, the, su the supply of safe, secure, reliable, and cost-effective electricity is the lifeblood of any modern economy. And particularly today, where we're seeing increased electrification in our world, in our lives. So the consumer needs to be able to afford that. Business needs to be able to afford it. We cannot put economic growth in jeopardy as a result of the energy transition. I, I think if we attempt to do that, it would be a real struggle to get society to come with us, irrespective of the benefits. So my own personal view is that we call it an energy transition. When you're in transition, things will be different. And you must remember, Europe, I, I don't want to say this lightly, but U Europe was drunk on cheap Russian gas for much of the first 20 years of this current century. And electricity prices, as a result of that, were, 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 were quite moderate in terms of overall household bu budget spends, et cetera, et cetera. So we, we, we need to be very clear with people that a transition will require investment. Investment means we're investing for the future. And I can certainly see a situation that when we get to a system that is dominated by renewables, is operating efficiently, wholesale electricity prices will be cheaper than they would otherwise be. Now, how you communicate that to the consumer, I think, is a challenge the sector has struggled with, in my view, and governments, from a policy perspective, ha has really struggled with. 
Are we looking at alternative sources of financing the energy transition? Putting consumers aside, are there sort of, um, you know, other financial instruments that could help us get there much faster without putting a strain on consumers? I think that's something that we really do have to look at. And I think in the main, and certainly here in Ireland, we're not. We're, we're actually currently foistering the cost of that transition of the electric power system, which is helping other sectors of the economy. It's helping, it's helping heating, it's helping transport. But the full cost of that transition, the capital that's being invested, is currently sitting right back on the customer's balance sheet. And I think that that's the wrong way of looking at this. I think that governments um, need to look at alternative ways of financing the infrastructure bill, the key infrastructure bill that's required, particularly around networks, particularly around networks. The sort of pricing mechanisms that we have in, in, in Western power markets, in, in European power markets, to, to carry the cost of upgrades and maintenance of, of, of power networks, I don't think those mechanisms are suitable for carrying the cost or assigning the cost ultimately to a complete transition of those networks that will be required and is necessary over the next decade or two. So I, I definitely think that's a long answer. We definitely need to look at it, but I don't get a sense that governments or regulators are looking at that. Right. Okay. So that's a real opportunity for the future then. Uh, new levers that can be um, drawn in order to move things faster. Yeah, and I think I think the interesting thing about that is that um, uh, when you have these discussions with people, people will say, look, it's the same rate paying base anyway. I don't think it is. I, I think the taxpayer rate base in any country is a slightly different rate paying base to electricity consumers, uh, if that makes sense. And that's what we have to look at. Like, ultimately, Mandana, the critical issue here is somebody has to pay. And the scale of transition that's required here is not going to come easy and it's not going to come cheap. And it needs to be done efficiently. That efficiency is the other big um, concern, isn't it? Because with um, all of this digitization and built-in flexibility into the grid, um, things can become less reliable and less efficient. So how do we move toward a much more stable uh, renewables integrated grid for the future? Um, uh if you look, if you look again at the at the Irish context, there was a, a groundbreaking piece of work done back in 2010 called the All Island Grid Study, which looked at and it was a, it was a really detailed power flow model study, which looked at how far we could push effectively the existing power networks, how much renewables we could accommodate on it, how much non synchronous the level of non synchronous forms of generation we could put on it, and. That study said that by the time we got to 75% SNSP, as we call it, system non-synchronous penetration, which is effectively wind and solar and even interconnectors in our case, the power system would be very close to collapse and, and we, couldn't, we couldn't get there. But our transmission system operator took the details of that study, and uh, the, the transmission system operator is AirGrid, and ESB, ESB networks who, who own the assets and, and who operate the distribution network have done some wonderful work uh, for an electrically isolated power system to allow us to get to a point today where we can see close to 70% non-synchronous penetration on the power system, and it's very, very stable. And the reason for that is, again, I, I always find engineering and, and science people are very smart, and if you give them a problem to solve, they will solve it. So we've introduced a very big focus on system services, you know, voltage control, frequency response, really focusing on that, looking at min-gen of our thermal power stations, things that help you increase the level of non-synchronous forms of generation. And what I can say today is that there are people now who I respect very well talking about a 100% SNSP limit on what is a relatively isolated electric power system. And uh, so I think we can get there. I think technology, I think storage, synchronous condensers. I mean, there are there are technologies sitting on the Irish power system today that you wouldn't have dreamed of 20 years ago. You know, battery energy storage at, at, at significant scale, and, and synchronous condensers to to provide to provide critical um, uh, system services like inertia, for example, has allowed us to at times see wind, wind energy meet 
70 to 80 percent of our needs when you include mm. the, the 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 export of, of renewable electricity from the power system so we've made incredible strides but i think to get to that 100 percent point to get to the point where with with appropriate backup of course uh you can you can get very close to a power system that is almost completely dominated by intermittent renewables to squeeze the last five or ten percent out of that system is going to be extremely expensive and one of the things that I think we should be looking at from a, a sector perspective, an industry perspective, from a government and a regulatory perspective is, do we need to squeeze the last million or two million tonnes of CO2 out of electric power systems? Because if we do, Mandana, that's going to be really, really expensive. So it's, it's really, and I firmly believe that's where the net in net zero comes from. I've always believed that. Um, you cannot run a modern power system on wind, solar, with, with battery storage and various bits and pieces. You need firm backup capacity. And today, globally, that is provided in the main by highly efficient gas-fired units. That's what the power system looks like in Ireland. The question for us is, how do we decarbonize that gas? Because I can never see a time where we will not require that firm backup capacity. We see periods here in Europe, the Dunkelflaute periods as they've become known, where the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow, not just for a few hours, but for days on end. And we have to meet customers' needs during that period of time. And that's the big challenge. That's the big challenge. But, but, I, but I do think, uh, you know, Ireland's energy policy is focused on seeing 80% of our electricity demand annually coming from renewables. And we will get there. We will get there. Going beyond 80% to 90% and then close to the 100, I think we've got to think about that in the context of cost and efficiency. Because a power system with that level of intermittent renewables sitting on it is going to be very expensive in my view. And these are the conversations that we'll be having at SGT26 in Paris next year, uh, both from a vision point of view and also technical execution and across uh, all domains of the grid. Uh, so thank you very much for joining us today, John. It's great to get your insights and your thoughts on this very important subject. And you've kindly agreed to join us at SGT26. So just to um, finish I'm, off. I'm, ver I'm very much looking forward to doing that, Mandana, because I think it's a, you know, it's a very, very exciting time, I think, to be part of, of, of an industry. We have, we have some really big commercial and, and technical challenges ahead of us, but I, I do believe as, as, as scientists and engineers and, 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 and commercial and technical professionals, we, we will get there. And it's so, so important that we do. Globally, it is so important that we do. So very, very much looking forward to, to meeting everybody in, in Paris next spring. Fantastic. We look forward to seeing you there. Thank you so much, John. Thanks for joining us today. You have a great evening. Thank you, Mandana. Thank you very much. Thank you. Join us again next week as we unpack another big topic shaping the future of the power grid. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Smart Grid Forums, and follow us on LinkedIn. Until then, thanks for watching and listening. This is Powering the Future, a podcast series brought to you by Smart Grid Forums. One planet, one power grid.